I love poetry. <laughs> Truth be told, it makes me kind of giddy. <laughs> you might even say, well, crazy. You know, good crazy, happy crazy, but crazy. Poetry stirs my mind and stills my soul. It disturbs the littleness of my life. Sometimes when I should be doing other things, often things that you think presidents should be doing, <laughs> I am off somewhere stealing a moment with Saints Auden and Neruda, Rilke and Heaney. Early in the morning or late at night, on quiet afternoons, in jammed airport lounges, or alone in another homogenous hotel room, it doesn't matter. There's always the intoxicating gift of a poem waiting for me. Many times I have sat for an hour or more just to savor a poem. In those stolen moments, my mind and my heart can be absolutely transformed. I too begin to see the world differently. I'm blessed with a whole new slant on what's important and not so important. I am refreshed. Then, after the content of the poem has, has dizzied my brain, I go back and demand of these word magicians, how did you do that? <laughs> With what analogies and similes did you knock me out of my familiar views of life and reorient my vision? What metaphors broke through my life's blinders and the daily droning to resurrect things that I avoided, lost, or painted over? How did you make an inaccessible truth so accessible to me? How did you move me from my one-dimensional world to a two or three, and I guess I confessed a four-dimensional world? Walter Brueggemann is oh so right when he says that this kind of language can amaze us and fill us with hope and energize us. You know, the thing that fills me with the greatest hope and energy is that I'm convinced that the poetic mind is at the heart of who we are as a people of faith. We are a people of the book, and our book contains some of the greatest poetry ever written. Indeed, our ability to recognize and embrace metaphor is essential to our faith. It is metaphor, not literalism, that enables our scriptures to come alive and to speak to generation after generation. From the Garden of Eden to the descending of the holy city Jerusalem, metaphors shape our faith. From the psalmist who declares, the Lord is my shepherd, and that God is my rock and my salvation, we are ministered to and given intimate access to the ineffable. From the prophets who speak to us preaching of the potter and the clay, or who envision a day when justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, we are moved and challenged in our faith. This ability to imagine a different reality is at the very heart of who we say we are as a people of faith. To boldly believe in the radical visions of Isaiah and Jesus, to truly imagine a new heaven and a new earth is at its core an act of faith that we call conversion. This transformation involves a new orientation of our body, mind, and spirit. This conversion is at the very heart of Paul's preaching as he offered a radical new definition of the community of faith, particularly to those who saw Christianity as merely another Jewish sect. It was Paul who said that if you take the gospel seriously, then you have to envision a community that has a much larger and far more uh, uh, diverse uh, makeup than anything that you've ever imagined. It includes Greeks and Jews, slave and free, male and female. It was Paul who said, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. This is the soul of a poet, the heart of one who sees a whole new reality and invites us into it. It is the preaching of one whom, like Isaiah and Jesus before him, sought to convert our imaginations. They each beckon us to envision things that no one has ever considered before, to go places and do things that few have had the courage to undertake. Our culture has become so narcissistic 
that we are running out of mirrors, award shows, and MySpace pages to admire ourselves. <laughs> we are relationally challenged to deal with people who are different from us, and so we build walls and tear each other apart and shoot at each other with 200 million guns, literally filling up our emergency wards. And were this not enough, or perhaps as a reflection of it, our seminaries, who are supposed to be turning out the moral and spiritual physicians to do triage in this bizarre ICU, seem to have lost their sense of mission and are busy fretting over almost every step they take. Like a quivering quail in the lights of an onrushing truck, our seminaries remain frozen in place and offer no model of imagination or hope to a world that needs them desperately. This is the very moment when we need a conversion of our imaginations. We need to bring some creative, life-giving, faith-filled, poetic perspective into our lives and into this world. Rather than wallow in our troubles, we need to recognize an incredible God-given opportunity. Rather than listening to the grieving and the unended expressions of anxiety and fear that surround us, the hand wringing and the pacing, we need to boldly leap forward, rediscover our sense of joy and radical amazement that is at the very heart of what it is to be a person of faith. Do you know what worries me the most? It is that there are too few voices that are seeking to discern what it is that God is calling us to do in this moment. I think we have a chance to do something that is radically new. I think we have a chance to reclaim our heritage as a school that created the model for theological education. We have a chance to do something that 200 from years from now, someone might say, damn, they did it again. <laughs> they did it again. We have a chance to do something beautiful for God. Let this be our revolution, that we make this place a laboratory for the imagination, a nursery for prophetic freedom fighters. Let's just not worry about one day or one class that we're going to reimagine. Let's reimagine a whole curriculum. How about that? Let's not worry just about seminaries, but the hundreds of churches and alternative faith communities. Let us think imaginatively, not just about one denomination or one faith tradition, but one with the most diverse ingathering of people of faith in this country. We need to ignite our imaginations. We all need to be poets. We need to be a little crazy. Allow your faith to imagine something radically new. Go ahead, imagine new things, radical things. Convert your imagination. Go ahead, I know you can do it. And as you contemplate the poetry of this moment, as you contemplate and sit and contemplate the poetry of the life around you, hear the words of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and the God's glory will, shall appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and the royalty, the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you, your sons shall come from far away and your daughters will be carried in arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Imagine that.